Morning to all of you, distinguished guests, uh, members of the diplomatic corps, uh, members of the media, our mayor of Cape Town, our MECs, our uh, representatives of other spheres of government, our party leadership. Uh, thank you very, very much for being here today, and of course, to our fellow citizens. It's good to stand here in front of you in person after what we've been through in the past two years. When discussing matters of public importance, it's often important for us to be able to look each other in the eye. It's also wonderful to see South Africans back in public spaces again, to see our people enjoying our beaches, uh, restaurants, theaters, and sports venues. And also great to see children returning to full-time schooling. It remains critical that what is left of the heavy-handed response to the pandemic is abolished, so that jobs and our economy can start to make a full recovery. The state of disaster must end, and it must end right away. And that is to make sure that we can remove the uncertainty that still hangs over businesses desperately trying to make a comeback in South Africa. Everything that we do this year must be focused on retaining and bringing back jobs and by helping businesses to survive. The impact of the past two years on our society, particularly on poverty and inequality, have been enormous. And I think, sadly, that we're yet to see the full scale of this. The lockdown restrictions were particularly devastating because they were implemented after a complete decade of state capture, which wiped out any gains made in reducing poverty in South Africa in the post-1994 environment. An epidemic of relentless corruption facilitated through the long-standing ANC virus of cadre deployment has hollowed out the state and it has destroyed our economy. The last two years of lockdown restrictions have seen poverty and inequality accelerating massively through joblessness and through widening disparities in education. The riots in July last year that were allowed to play out unchecked by the state and rooted in the same epidemic of corruption took poverty and hardship to a completely different level. Indeed, the epidemic of corruption remains largely unchecked. The result? Well, by the end of the, by the third quarter of last year, only 36% of our working population was in employment. Only 36% of our working age population was in employment. Now, as time passes, we're going to start to get a clearer picture of just how much these pandemic restrictions uh, have worsened our situation. But it's not likely to be a good story. And so we're going to have to make a conscious effort as parliament, as government, as politicians, as legislators, to reverse all of those things as best as we can. The COVID-19 pandemic has now become endemic and it's far more benign uh, than it was a year or two back. It will be around in some shape or form for many years to come. And so will a lot of other diseases and other risks. We have to remain rational and we have to remain sensible. Our approach must be one which does not create more harm than it is seeking to prevent. Now, when the virus was new and nobody really had its measure or certainty about it, it was understandable to err on the side of caution. But it soon became abundantly evident that many of these interventions were not necessary, and in fact, many of them were profoundly harmful. The harm done, for instance, by keeping school children out of school far outweighed any possible benefit to them. The harm done by, uh, the to the hospitality and tourism sectors by imposing alcohol and curfews and those types of bans far outweighed their benefit. It took government too long to admit these things, and the harm was allowed to continue long after we knew that many of these interventions were in fact not necessary. 
Now, arguably one of the most important aspects of dealing with the pandemic is the ability to change your views and reassess your actions as you discover new information. But this is not something that only applies to the coronavirus pandemic. It's in fact true for most things in life. Progress is only possible if we constantly reassess what we know, if we learn the truth about something. And this is different from what we once believed. We need to be able to have the agility to change our course. And this certainly applies to the ANC and government and the epidemic of corruption that it brings. Because today in 2022, there can be no more doubt about what the ANC has become. A self-serving organization whose goal is not governance and leadership, but power and accumulation. The cadres deployed by the ANC to institutions of state have spread like a virus, crippling those institutions from within. The job-killing bouts of load shedding we continue to experience are but one result of a captured and a corrupt state. Those harms will take decades to reverse, and they cannot be reversed under the ANC because they refuse to abandon the corrupt practice of CADA deployment. And the actors of state capture have by no means been neutralized, and they're still working very hard every day to undermine our democracy. Despite clear evidence emerging from various sources, including the Zondo Commission, which implicated ANC politicians and cadres, they still remain largely untouched by the law. Now, ominously, the bulwark of our democracy, the judiciary, remains under threat from the ANC itself, as we saw from the minutes which emerged during the Zondo Commission, but as well from a judicial service commission dominated by political actors allied to the corruption epidemic. Just last week, some of our most distinguished judges in South Africa were subjected to the most appalling and undermining questioning by JSC members who are aligned with the forces of corruption and violence that are destroying South Africa. The JSC requires urgent reform to remove this influence of politicians, and the DA, through our justice spokespersons, will be tabling a bill to this effect during the course of this year. But this is only one part of the change that is going to be required. As we have seen in the Gupta leaks and the Zondo report and countless exposés, the ANC today is closer to a crime syndicate and a terrorist organization than a political party. And its mutated variant, the EFF, is following a similar but even more extreme and ominous playbook. Our country will not survive the destruction caused by the agreed and their internal warfare for longer. Some of us have known this for a long time. Others have just started to realize it now. But as a country, we can no longer deny that the party of national government, the ANC, bears no resemblance to the liberation movement that took office in 1994. And the question now is, what will voters do with this knowledge? And thankfully, this question has already been partly answered in the local government elections which took place in November last year. Because for the first time since 1994, the majority of voters chose not to vote. In a country in which voting is a hard one right for the majority and is commonly equated to voting for the ANC. This is a profound shift for South Africa. Crucially, most of those who did vote chose parties other than the ANC. Now, with two years to go before the next national elections, this sea change presents a crucial opportunity to dramatically change the trajectory of our country. The 2021 election showed that an ANC government is no longer an inevitability and that there is now a very real chance of replacing it with a coalition built around reform, accountability, and the rule of law. But such is the speed and scale of the looting and destruction that we may have only this one chance. Our country is being stripped bare, 
liquidated and set alight as we speak. Now, I don't want to spend this entire address painting the bleak, bleak picture of, of where we're at as a country because we already know this. In a few days' time, President Ramaphosa will stand up uh, in the front of the Cape Town City Hall, a new temporary venue for Parliament since our National Assembly buildings was burnt down, and he will set out his version of the state of our nation. Now, he's going to most likely offer up a raft of new uh, multi-point plans, task teams, workshops, commissions, along with solemn promises that this time he and his government are really serious about tackling unemployment, crime, corruption, and service delivery, just as they were last year, and the year before that, and the year before that. He will likely blame the pandemic for most of our woes. And what he can't pin on COVID, he'll chalk up to global conditions or global headwinds or apartheid. And I know this because we've seen this movie every single year. Without fail, as we move further away from the sonar and its lofty promises and high rhetoric, the same script plays out year after year. None of the promised economic reforms materialize. None of the energy reforms materialize. None of the big new investments materialize. And not one ANC cadre or politician implicated in corruption is convicted by the NPA. And every year, our country slips further and further towards a failed state. Now, if you want to know the true state of our nation, don't take the president's word for it on Thursday night, and you don't even have to take my word for it either. Go and see for yourself. Take a drive through the towns and villages of provinces like the Eastern Cape, Mpumalanga, Limpopo, or KZN, and even some of the larger cities in Gauteng. The scale of the decay you'll encounter is frankly staggering. Potholes, cracked pavements, litter, uncollected refuge, sewerage spills, broken streetlights, dry taps, electricity substations stripped bare, train stations carried out piece by piece, schools vandalized, hospitals only partly operational, and long queues at clinics, police vehicles sitting unused and unusable at police stations. Outside of the Western Cape and DA-run towns, very little in our country is actually working, and large parts of it resemble today a war zone. And along with this, you will also find the heartbreaking scene repeated in every city and every town of thousands of men and women without work and very little hope of changing this. Don't let the president tell you that this level of unemployment and desperation is normal and that all countries took a knock in the past two years. There is nothing natural or inevitable about our job numbers and the inability to make that graph head in the other direction while economies around the world are recovering. This is nothing less than a self-made catastrophe. And this catastrophe started long before anyone had ever heard of COVID-19. Don't let him sweep his failure to implement reforms, attract investment, and create jobs under the COVID carpet, because he's going to try to do just that. The reality is that these failures were baked into the country long before the COVID-19 pandemic ever hit our shores. The state of the nation is that of an ANC government failing on every single front. A ruling party so preoccupied with fighting with enemies within its own ranks and clinging to power so desperately that it absolutely has no more capacity to do its jobs. And so, one by one, every critical function of the state has simply seized up. Our state power utility cannot supply sufficient electricity. Water infrastructure is collapsing. Sewerage treatment plants no longer work. The rail network has all but collapsed. That is the true state of our nation. But amid all of this destruction and decay, there are islands of hope. 
DA run, provincial, local governments show that things can be different. Over the past two years, in every wave of the pandemic, the DA run Western Cape made sure that there were always enough hospital beds and there was always enough oxygen. While the DA run city of Cape Town delivered chronic TB medication to people at home. Only in the Western Cape did school feeding schemes continue uninterrupted to make sure that we were feeding needy and hungry children. And only school, and, and fighting those school closures. Only in the Western Cape did creches continue getting their subsidies. This is the DA difference. And it's this DA difference that saved so many lives. Consider that age standardized excess mortality during the epidemic in the Western Cape was the lowest in the country and 30% lower than the national average. This is what governments should do in a pandemic, retain and ramp up services, not cut services, not destroy jobs and restrict people's freedoms. The DA difference is that people lucky enough to live in a well-established DA municipality like Cape Town, Overstrand, Stellenbosch and Midval can at least rely on local government to deliver services such as fire services, street lights, refuse removal and local uh, road resurfacing. The DA difference is that public money is spent on public goods and not simply stolen to make politicians and cronies richer. But so many of the other critical functions of the state are in the hands of national government or national controlled state-owned enterprises. So these islands of excellence run the risk of being swamped by a sea of national government failure. And so the DA difference now is also about protecting people from national government failures. Where we govern, we know we have to step in where national government has now failed, particularly on critical issues such as providing electricity, public transport, and effective policing. Not least because these things enable job-creating businesses to start and to thrive, but the big thing is that this DA different doesn't only benefit the residents. Where we govern, we've also shows what a post-ANC country could look like, and that should be of interest to every single South African. The city of Cape Town and several other DA-run municipalities in the Western Cape are planning to protect their residents from Eskom's collapse by buying electricity directly from independent power producers. When that happens, people will be able to see for themselves the benefits and they will realize that we don't have to stick to the ANC's outdated model of one massive state-owned enterprise. Already Cape Town routinely shields its residents from one full stage of load shedding to the well-maintained and serviced Steenbrus Dam hydroelectric scheme. DA-run metros are also taking on more and more law enforcement responsibilities to prevent crime and to produce safer communities. This will show people that the most effective policing happens when it has been decentralized and brought closer to the communities it is meant to be protecting. And we've already seen evidence of how the DA difference saves lives. While murders in every other province spiked last year by an average of 6% and 13% in the first and second quarters compared to 2019, in the DA-run Western Cape, murders actually dropped. This is because of fewer murders in areas such as Delft, where there's been additional local government policing through provincially funded LEAP programs, which targets areas with high murder rates and insufficient policing numbers. The city of Cape Town is also challenging national government now for control of the metro rail passenger trains. Now, if it succeeds in getting this right and manages to turn this failing service around, and integrated with the rapid, rapid bus transport system, hundreds of thousands of commuters will be able to return to safe, affordable, and reliable public transport. And that's what we mean by the DA difference. With two years to go now before the critical 2024 elections, 
DA-run governments will serve as the living, breathing evidence of how people's quality of life can improve dramatically under a different national government. And that quality of life is first and foremost about jobs. Because a functioning state enables a jobs-creating economy. When people have jobs, they have personal freedom, they have dignity, and they have choices. And they have the chance to realize their own full potential. Now, while expanded unemployment has increased by one-fifth across the country compared to 2019, the DA-run Western Cape still has the lowest rate of 30% compared to 46,6% for the country as a whole. The DA difference is life-changing in every single way. It's clean running water, flushing toilets, reliable electricity and regular refuse removal, all of which combine to foster an environment where jobs can grow. The DA difference is that more children can stay in school all the way to their matric exams. The DA difference is that more children get a solid meal at school and are so able to concentrate better. The DA difference is fewer children going hungry and malnourished. The DA difference is better educated children with a better chance of escaping poverty and hardship. The DA difference is accountable governance with clean audits, not just for clean audit's sake, but so that public money gets spent on real services for the public to make their lives better rather than being stolen and frittered away by politicians. The DA difference is that more people have a chance to own their home and have the title deeds to show it. This means that more people can access loans to start a business. It means more people have something to pass on to their children and their grandchildren. The DA difference is safer communities and better public transport. To date, we've mainly been able to demonstrate the DA difference in local and provincial government. But we're not certainly a party we are absolutely not a party that's content to govern at local and provincial level only. We are absolutely waiting to be able to step into national government. Our vision for South Africa also addresses those broader challenges that we face of unemployment, inequality, crime and corruption, housing, migration, the energy crisis and protecting our environment. Our existing economic justice policy contains incredible proposals that speak to a number of these issues and include interventions to combat school dropout rates, uh, teacher absenteeism and malnutrition and stunting in children. The document also sets out measures to address the legacy of migratory labour system, proposals on shared parental leave, as well as measures to address the culture of low savings among South Africans. And that's just to name a few. During the course of this year, we're going to release a further series of policy positions which we envisage to be part of the foundation of a new policy approach for a new realigned government in 2024. We now have two years to make our case and convincingly demonstrate the DA difference in the places where we govern. Two years now to show people that there are two distinct parties of government in South Africa that have two distinct and very different approaches to almost every aspect of governance and the state. One that still believes that people should live at the mercy of government and depend on an all-powerful state, and the other that believes in the ingenuity and creativity of people and trusts them to be able to release and realize and unleash, unleash their dreams if they're just given the chance. One that still believes in centralized control and an all-powerful president, while the other believes in decentralization and nurtures diverse and principled leaders from all walks of life. One that believes that the only way to create jobs is to make government and the state even bigger than it currently is. While the other believes that government needs to get out of the way so that businesses big and small can flourish so that they can employ people. Dependence and control versus freedom and dignity. Those are the choices. 
But what we also need to be clear about over the next years is who exactly we are up against. The enemy of growth and progress is the ANC, together with its variant, the EFF. Our opponents are not all the other parties, like Action SA, the IFP, the Freedom Front Plus, COPE, the UDM, and the ACDP. And we cannot allow ourselves to be drawn into silly skirmishes with them. We all have a common opponent in the ANC. And for the most part, we all agree on more issues with one another than we do with either the ANC or the EFF. So the DA doesn't need to get 51% of the vote to topple the ANC. We only need to keep them and the EFF below 50% and then ensure that we are at the heart of a coalition government that can implement proper reforms and clean out the rot within the state. And we also have to do this now, because we are fast running out of time. At the rate at which the ANC is destroying our country, there might not be much to save in a few years' time. Or worse, democratic change at the ballot box may in fact no longer be possible. The challenge of holding at bay national failure as much as we can and of reversing decades of ANC decline where we newly govern is immense. And it's going to require clear principles and diverse skills where we govern in partnership with our allies. But the DA is resolute. And as a party of principle and diversity, we will bring all of our experience of governing and of managing coalitions towards the liberation of South Africa from the ANC corruption, the chaos and the decay. There is no other way out. Now, South Africans have shown in the last election that they are ready for a post-ANC future. They are ready for a better, more prosperous, more inclusive future. But perhaps some still can't see it working out that way. The only way is through political change, and the DA has an excellent roadmap to reach this destination. And we invite South Africans from all over the country who have not already done so to turn their disillusionment with the ANC into participation in the DA and other parties committed to constructive change. There is a far better alternative for our country, but this alternative can only be shaped by your participation. Join us in creating a new future of hope and prosperity in South Africa. If we can demonstrate the DA difference where we govern, if we can show South Africans that hope is on the way and that change is on the horizon, and we can marshal the resources of all those people who believe in freedom and prosperity and a better future for South Africa around our banner, and we can do this convincingly, then I believe nothing and nobody will stand in our way from achieving our goal of getting into government and starting the work of building a more prosperous, inclusive and growing South Africa, the country that we love. So join us on this journey as we set out to build this new future for our country. Thank you.